Before we talk about Mary and Martha, I'd like to talk about Abraham. When Abraham looks up and sees three strangers at his door, he does what's proper and expected in his culture. He invites them in for a meal and a rest. Now, such hospitality is a little bit more than we Westerners practice, but in that part of the world, it's a very big deal, even today. The fact that Abraham invites his guests to stop and eat is not unusual, but what is unusual is the amount of food that he prepares. A little bread ends up being three measures of flour. That's about seven gallons worth of flour. Think how many loaves of bread you could make with that, let alone the little flatbreads they were probably eating. And then on top of that, there's cheese and an entire fatted calf. This is not so much a snack as it is a smorgasbord. I'll bet there were even little umbrellas in the drinks. <laughs> now, if you read this story as the narrator offers it, it makes sense, right? Because how else would one respond to God upon one's doorstep? But if you pay attention, I notice it never says that Abraham recognizes that this is God. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. That's what it says. Now, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I don't know about you. When I see three men standing together, my first thought is, gee, I wonder if that's God. <laughs> so if Abraham didn't know that these three men were God, why did he offer them such extravagant hospitality? I'm left wondering if that's just who Abraham was. If he was the kind of guy that just rolled out the red carpet for anybody. And if that's the case, this story thinks that that's a virtue of his. And that makes it all the more interesting to read that story alongside this story of Mary and Martha. Because the way we typically read that story, Martha is chastised by Jesus for doing the very thing that Abraham does, offering hospitality to God. So how in the world can we possibly understand Abraham's virtue to be Martha's vice? Once again, I think the answer might be in forgetting what we think we know about the story and paying closer attention to what it actually says. St. Luke says that Martha complained to Jesus because she was distracted by her many tasks. As I hear us talk about this story, typically we tend to focus on the fact that he, she's doing many tasks, that that's the problem, that she's too busy. But what I hear is that the real problem is that these tasks are distracting her. And that makes me ask, distracting her from what? I think Mary might help us answer that question. Mary, St. Luke says, is sitting at Jesus' feet. She's taken the position of a disciple. Lots of people, men, women, children, everybody went out to hear Jesus in the streets and the countrysides. But discipling. Sitting at the feet of a rabbi, attaching oneself to a teacher to study the law, that's men's work, right? Traditionally. And while discipling was men's work, women's work then was typically more domestic, right? Things like preparing food, hosting, entertaining guests. Notice Abraham is the one that commanded the spread to be set, but who did all the work, right? It was Sarah. And that's why Martha is upset. Maybe she's embarrassed that her sister has so flagrantly violated her gender role. But it seems to me that she's more upset that Mary isn't where she should be, helping out in the kitchen. And that tells me that for Martha, providing all of this hospitality isn't something she's doing because she wants to, but because it's expected of her, like it was expected of Sarah. She has those same expectations of Mary, and when Mary doesn't meet them, that's when she becomes exasperated. By contrast, Abraham provided an embarrassingly lavish spread for his guests, not because he felt that was expected, but because he wanted to. Because it pleased him to show generosity to random strangers. Martha's work doesn't seem to please her, does it? If it did, 
She wouldn't resent the lack of help. Now, while Martha is busy doing what she should be doing, Mary is busy doing what she shouldn't be doing. So why is that? Why is Mary in the living room instead of the kitchen? What is it that presses her to violate these social norms that hold her sister so tightly? To embarrass herself and her family by acting like a man? I think on that, the story is pretty clear, right? If Jesus is in your living room, where else would you rather be? As I read this story, it seems to me that while both Mary and Martha know who Jesus is, only Mary really understands what that means. They both see somebody powerful, important, influential, but only Mary sees someone that she wants to spend more time with. Only Mary seems to have some sense of what it means to have this person in her home, to have this opportunity to sit at his feet, and by God, she's going to take it, even if it makes her look uh, funny to everybody else. It might be perfectly reasonable to want to show Jesus the kind of incredible hospitality that Abraham showed, but that doesn't seem to be what is motivating Martha. I wonder if Martha doesn't recognize God in her midst. I wonder if that is what her many tasks are distracting her from. And that, I think, is something worthwhile for us to contemplate. Is it possible to be so busy in our many tasks for God's kingdom that we fail to see God standing at our door, sitting in our living room, eating at our table? This story hits home for me because I am frequently and consistently distracted by my job as a pastor from recognizing God in my presence. Committee meetings, sermon deadlines, pastoral care calls. I get so lost in the day-to-day -day business of the church, I often forget why I'm doing these things, what they mean. I have to intentionally practice mindfulness and prayer to call myself back to the bigger picture to remind myself of what God is doing here rather than getting lost in what I have to do or should do or would like to do or haven't done. And as I sit and think about this text, I wonder if that might also be happening to us as a community. I wonder if we as a congregation throw ourselves into our ministry as much out of a sense of obligation or responsibility or tradition is anything else with little thought to why we are doing these things service ministries congregational meetings committees volunteer work we do it and we do it with gusto but have we stopped to ask why I may be completely out of line here maybe I'm just projecting my own challenges onto the rest of us but what I can say with complete honesty is that I think I can count on my hands the number of times I have heard the name of God uttered in this building outside of Sunday in the last seven years. And that tells me something. It leads me to wonder, are we distracted by our many tasks? I don't offer this as a criticism I'm certainly not pointing fingers because I am as much as guilty, if not more, than anyone. Instead, I point this out because I wonder if that's part of what is making us so anxious. I don't think it's news to anyone that life at Anu's Day is just a little bit more stressful these days than it has been in the past. COVID has not helped this, but it's not entirely to blame either. As I ponder this stress and anxiety, I wonder if it comes from a fear that with as much as we are doing, we are still not doing enough or that we're not doing it well enough. I hear this fear in the way that we talk about our programs and our mission and our budget. This veiled threat that if we don't grow, we will die. We want to see a sanctuary full and 
vibrant programs, especially kids' programs, in order to feel like we're being successful. I wonder, with how hard we work at community service and social justice, if maybe there isn't just some small part of us that's trying to justify ourselves to the world, to convince everyone out there, and if we're being honest, maybe even to convince ourselves a little bit, that this congregation is worth the time and the resources that we dedicate to it. But what I remember is that this world out there, along with all of its measures of success, like attendance and financial stability and growth, that that's the world that we're hoping that God will save because it's condemned itself. Is that the world that we want setting our expectations for ourselves? Telling us what we should be doing? Where we should be? If congregations exist to gather around the presence of God, to help bring people to sit at the feet of Christ, I wonder if we're letting ourselves do that, or if instead we're busying ourselves in the kitchen because we feel like that's what we should be doing. It makes me wonder, do we really believe that sitting at Jesus' feet is where we belong? Or is there some part of us that believes that that's for other, better, more qualified, more holy people than us? Do we really believe that Jesus has called us to follow, to be his disciples, to sit at his feet? When Jesus says that Mary has chosen the better part, I don't hear him rebuking Martha, not at all. I hear him reassuring her that she too belongs with him, not hidden away in the kitchen. The food will get prepared, the house will be made, the laundry will get done, all in good time. What she needs to hear in that moment is that she too belongs at Jesus' feet. She too is one of all those things that are held together in him. Her place and our place is with Christ. And there's nothing that we can do or fail to do that will change that. Thinking back to Abraham's story, I noticed that it is his love for his visitors that seems to precede his realization of God's presence. Looking out at this community, I wonder if we were to show ourselves the kind of love that we show for everyone else, the love that we are so busy spreading for everybody else out there, if we were to treat ourselves with the same kind of tenderness and grace that we offer to the world, might we also somehow recognize God here in and among us? The letter to the Colossians says that Jesus is the one through whom and for whom all things have been created, the one in whom all things are held together. This means that this one alone is the source of our worth and our value, not our many tasks. There is nothing else that is needed. So I wonder, does our work distract us from that truth or proclaim it?